the world is indeed shrinking smaller we can now travel the vast distances to the end of our solar system smaller because television and radio can bring us pictures and sounds from any place on the earth or moon in a millionth of a second and smaller once the world was made up of thousands of different pea pipes and now like rare species of bird and cat many are disappearing we used to be many now we are fewer well all human beings share basic desires to our common biology it is culture the particular beliefs habits and skills which make us different it is impossible to imagine the total effort made by the billions of humans to solve the problems of living and ultimately of survival it is this which is mankind's greatest achievement in our century the african continent has turned from a mostly colonized set of territories to a series of nations sometimes the efforts of nationalism are made with a gentle hand sometimes with brute force either way the smaller indigenous cultures are pushed into nation states and as a result is threatened this is a group of bajaka pygmies near the sangay river in the central african republic for two days these twelve men eighteen women and thirty three children have wandered about the rainforest looking for a suitable place for their new village the pygmies have been a part of western mythology since the middle ages stories of strange creatures half animal half human spread around the western world being less than five feet tall they were classified as dwarfs it is hard for us to imagine living in the middle of a twentieth century how the adventurers from europe must have perceived these people the pygmies today inhabit the territory from the eastern edge of zaire to the cameroon the equatorial rainforest is their natural environment their home and it provides all that is necessary to sustain life the pygmies are nomads staying in an area as long as nature provides and moving on when the necessities of life are harder to find by hunting the animals of the forest for food and using vegetation for both food and shelter they manage to live in harmony with nature each family builds its own hut so that as the men go off to hunt the women and girls begin to construct their new homes Life expectancy for a pygmy is about 40 years, and all of those years are spent in hard work. A woman who becomes pregnant works right up to the birth of her child. For the pygmies, twin births are common, and sometimes an albino child with pale skin and snow white hair will be born to a pygmy woman. A few hours later, the basic structure of the hut is completed. In the days to come, porches will be erected at the entrances and the huts will be insulated with small branches and brushwood. The interior space is relatively small, with each person getting about 15 square feet of floor space. The modern world of shrinking natural resources is beginning to threaten the pygmy's existence. The Industrial Revolution is coming to the jungle, as it has already come to much of the world with the effect of diminishing the land and wildlife of the rainforest. Between 1930 and 1970, the forests were reduced in area by one-third. English ethnologist Dr. Colin Turnbull and Professor Hans Jurgens have written of the pygmies, where the rainforest is being eroded, the pygmies have no chance of survival. The physical, biological, and psychological development of these people is dependent on the existence of the tropical forest. Try to take them out of it, and most of them will die of heart, blood, and stomach diseases. The hunting skills of the pygmies result from their keen perception of nature. These men are looking for tortoises. In quick succession, Yasi, Makala, and Ayundi make successful catches. The terrain of the forest is gently undulating, 
under its cover of dense primeval forest. The branches of the tall trees meet high overhead and shut out the heat and the glare of the sun. Makala and Ayundi are making slings to carry the live tortoises on the long journey back home. Yasi's exuberance at the success of the hunt finds expression in the Eboka Kudu, the tortoise dance. Not far away, another group of hunters has found a crocodile's nest made out of mud and brush. It is full of eggs and much appreciated by the hungry hunters. In preparing to climb a tall tree and hunt of a female hornbill, Mindumi is fashioning an aid made from the fibers of a liana plant. Today there are about 30,000 pygmies in the African rainforest, down drastically from a total of one million in the 18th century. With the arrival of the Bantus, who were themselves forced into the forest from the plains, a natural antagonism developed. The Bantus have never adapted to this environment. It is not their home as it is for the pygmies. With the smoke from burning leaves and twigs, he smokes out the bird. The animal population of the rainforest has been dramatically reduced over the last four decades. Ultimately, this poses the most serious threat to the pygmies, loss of their major source of protein. Commercial developers slice away at the land available for animal life, and hunters continue to exploit the worth of animal skins. In response, the government of a Central African Republic has passed hunting laws which carry heavy penalties for violators. The pygmies are exempt from prosecution since it is clear that they, who have lived here for thousands of years, are not responsible for the reduction of the once abundant animal life. Belu, the leader, must decide when it is time to hunt and time to move the village. Considered the wisest and most morally fit member of the group, he will also negotiate and trade with the neighboring Bantu tribes. Also a fine craftsman, Belu is making a tool called a joe, which is used to hoe the bulbs of the liana plant. These bulbs will be roasted or boiled. Pygmies are constantly on the lookout for food. They gather and hunt everything edible in the forest. The women dig out roots and bulbs, pick all varieties of fruits, seeds, and nuts, catch fish, and collect snails, mussels, and even termites. Feeding the group requires a total community effort.
child rearing is free of cruelty and harsh discipline. In Western terms, it is anti-authoritarian. Boys and girls living at home until they marry have complete freedom in choosing a marriage partner. A boy is recognized as a man and a hunter when he is killed with his spear. There's always a nearby stream in which they can play. Adolescent youths generally are more serious in their games, using them to develop the skills they will need to hunt. In the leisure time provided by the abundant forest, the younger children will make toys for themselves. Sometimes they are imitation of adult tools, while others appear to be purely for fun, spinning tops made from nuts, whistles from dried fruits, and floating darts from leaves. It is late afternoon and Makala is busy using the blunt edge of his axe separating the bark from a motunga tree. Makala must be careful not to split it, making it useless as a mattress. The barks of trees are used by the pygmies for making slings in which mothers carry their babies, for covering their huts when no leaves are available, and for preparing medicines. The climate here is quite consistent, with temperatures ranging from 70 to 90 degrees, although the average humidity of 95% makes the nights and mornings chilly. Rain comes in torrential downpours but last only an hour or two, usually in the late afternoon or evening. Such cloudbursts can be expected at any time of year, although December and January tend to be the least rainy months. Early in the morning, under Belu's direction, the men set out on a hunting trip. Not far from camp, they spot a bull elephant in a clearing. The animal, sensing the men approaching, moves off. In a symbolic act, Belu spits on the ground, hoping to bring good luck for the day's hunt. There is no certainty that the men will find and kill an animal for today's meal. In the village, the women and children begin a day of basket weaving and skirt making. <laughs> The 
baskets are used for carrying almost everything the group possesses. Saucepans, kindling wood, household crockery, and even elephant meat. After beating the bark of a liana plant to soften it, the women tear of a tough fiber into strips, which are then smoothed out and woven together. The pygmies also get some of their clothing material from the Bantu tribes, although it is generally costly and unsuitable for life in the rainforest. The liana skirts are better able to withstand the rough treatment of passing through thick undergrowth and the permeating dampness of the rainforest. So far, the hunting party has met with no success as the search continues. Yasi finds a leaf wet with the urine of a red river hog. Yasi has killed the Red River hog. Having stabbed the animal several times, he now has a bent spearhead and puts it aside for repair later. The hunters are pleased with their good fortune. As the curing, preserving, and storing of meat is unknown, all food is prepared and eaten immediately. Women and children together are responsible for the preparation and cooking of meals. These bulbs are being mashed into a fine flour, which is then stirred into boiling water, making a food similar to a dumpling. Dr. Colin Turnbull of the American Museum of Natural History writes, food is man's primary need. If the forest had denied the pygmies a sufficiency of food, they would either have died out or developed new technologies for food gathering, perhaps including the principles of cultivation. But the forest did not, and they are still nomadic. They usually stay in a location for about a month. By then, the animals will have been scattered, the vegetation will be nearly picked clean, and even the refuse of a month's living will have become a problem.
The women have absolute equality with the men and are in no way seen as servants. A woman's role as wife and mother is honored and respected by her husband and children. The pygmies, who were mentioned in Egyptian writings of 4,500 years ago, came into existence rather late in human history, perhaps as recently as 30,000 years ago. At that time, the more desirable plains were becoming crowded with food gatherers and hunters. It was necessary for some to move into less friendly environments, like the rainforest. Natural selection gave the pygmies their small size and weight, because this is best for getting around in the tangled jungle. Their size made their survival possible. Although monogamy is the generally accepted rule, a man sometimes has two or three wives, especially when the first wife does not bear children. When adultery occurs among the pygmies, the matter goes into arbitration. A wronged husband then is entitled to ask for restitution in the form of useful items such as kitchen pots, spearheads, and axes. The men travel great distances in search of honey. Yasi and Maketi are looking for dead bees and a clue to the location of a succulent comb. Belu has called a halt in front of a tree. He sees his brow to indicate to others that he has discovered a bee's nest at the top of the tree. While Yasi climbs with the aid of a liana creeper, the others light a fire. Because of the almost daily rain and the chilly nights, Pygmies often suffer from colds. Honey is an excellent treatment. Bekama is weaving a basket out of the fine strips of bark which will be used to carry the honeycomb from the treetop. The acquisition of honey is impossible without fire and on every trip, the men carry bundles of smoldering twigs in order to start a fire more easily and quickly. There is a saying among the Bajakas that a long time ago, a chimpanzee stole fire from the gods and gave it to the humans. Yossi's bundle of smoldering leaves is now taken to the top of the tree. One by one, Yasi and Maketi break open the honeycomb and suck out the sweet nectar. Even the tiny larvae from the breeding combs are happily consumed. Honey season, a time when food is plentiful, marks the height of pygmy relaxation and merrymaking. As Dr. Turnbull has written, it was while I was with them during one honey season that I suddenly felt I was beginning to understand the pygmies that I began to know as they knew what their life was all about. Life for the pygmy is meant to be enjoyed. (laughs) 
Back at the village, the honey is received by the children and made into a sweet drink. Rarest of all the forest animals is the bongo, the great antelope of the woods, a creature of legend and myth. In the ongoing search for food, these women are off on a fishing trip. Fish are another important source of protein for the pygmies. In order to catch the fish, two dams are built, about 24 feet apart, out of branches, twigs, and mud. As the flow of the stream is halted, the women set to work, scooping out the water from a pool formed by the two dams. With delight, the women begin gathering the squirming fish and throw them into every available pot, pan, and basket. Fishing can also be dangerous. A shock from an electric eel can throw one of the women to the ground. Today, there are none in the catch. The men have killed the rare bongo and a celebration follows. There is, however, a fear that the evil spirits will leave the body of the animal and enter the body of the hunter. Belu, who killed the bongo, is rubbing a red paste made from the paduk tree onto his forehead. The ritual is intended to ward off the evil spirits which dwell in the bongo and which could bring bad luck to the village. The Bajakas believe that evil spirits live in the white spots on the skin of the bongo's head. Yasi exercises it by cutting out these spots with his knife. The same thing is done with the spots around the bottom of the animal's leg.
Then, to make absolutely sure that the demon is forever banished, Yasi buries the circles of white skin in the ground. He then beats the leaves together to proclaim that the antelope is ready for butchering. After butchering the animal, the men gather to smoke a pipe of hashish and reflect upon the events of a day and on their god, Kumba, the supreme being. Kumba lives behind the clouds. He made the earth, sun, moon, and stars. And he gave the pygmies the forest and the animals so that they would not starve. The shrinking natural environment has led to increasing contact with the dominant Bantu and Sudanic tribes and left the pygmies second-class citizens in the countries they inhabit. These Africans believe they own pygmies as they own their own land, and they unhesitatingly say so. This claim has given rise to the myth that pygmies are hereditary servants, if not slaves, of their Negro masters. While the pygmies are exploited, the realities are far more complicated. When a pygmy hunting group feels like a change from the forest, perhaps some palm wine to drink or tobacco to smoke, or when hunting is not particularly good and the chase takes them near the Bantu village, they will camp and bring gifts of meat, firewood, and honey. They receive plantation goods and food in return. But as soon as the Negroes begin to apply any pressure, or as soon as the pygmies tire of the village, nothing will stop them from packing up and returning to the forest. The skin of the bongo is dried near the fire and then made into a bag for carrying poison arrows for the hunt. The bajakas are skilled in making nets and leather bags, but metal equipment, such as axes, knives, and pans, must be acquired through bartering. Shaving of heads, piercing of upper lips, tattooing and sharpening of teeth are all held as symbols of beauty by the pygmies. These practices now require the use of razor blades purchased from neighboring tribes. Belu's wife, Ajama, has shaved Maypo's head to achieve the desired effect. Since the pygmies hunt with the use of poison, it is necessary to construct a press to extract that poison from the juice of the Mbangu creeper. efficient poison that is highly prized by the pygmies is only found in the higher regions of the rainforest. The mixture must be thick enough to form a solid head on the arrow to ensure a swift death.
Poison heads are dried over a fire. The work is dangerous as the smallest slip will mean death. Finally, the arrows are cut to length and tiny triangular leaves are fixed to ensure stability. The pygmies who live in the eastern rainforest still hunt with bow and arrow, while those in the western part, the bajacas included, long ago adopted the crossbow, introduced to them by Portuguese explorers. Again, the men set off early for the hunt. The men are now deep into the bush, and for the first time they hear apes in the treetops. To get them down within the reach of the crossbows, Belu, using a flute, imitates the cry of the eagle, the monkey's greatest enemy. The trick works, and the apes scamper down into the range of the crossbow. The poison arrow has entered the vein and caused instant paralysis in both creatures. The flesh is not poisoned and does not need treatment to make it safe to eat.
A bull elephant has been killed by the men. Using short spears, they were able to stab him in the vulnerable soft underbelly. The entire village is happy over this mountain of flesh, which will feed everyone for at least two weeks. The long-range prognosis for the pygmies is, unfortunately, rather bleak. The African countries, some rather poor, may not be willing or able to afford the luxury of a race of people who require two and a half square miles per person simply to live. Although some plans have been made for preserving the pygmy way of life, none have gotten beyond the planning stage. One such plan would turn large areas of jungle into national parks where jungle life, including the pygmies, could carry on without disturbance. Professor Hans Jurgens, who has studied the pygmies and supports the plan, doubts that it will ever come into existence. Jurgens writes, there are big game parks in the steppe areas which have been good for those African countries because they are big tourist attractions. But the jungle parks would not appeal so much to the tourists. They would not want to spend weeks cutting through dense vegetation, climbing over fallen trees every few feet, fighting off insects and disease, just to find a few pygmies. I think the pygmies are doomed. I expect the race to die out within 30 years, and I don't think there is a thing that can be done about it. Three months later, Bailu and his family are on the move again. Only the huts will remain as evidence of the community that once dwelt here. Small indigenous cultures all over the world have begun to disappear, reducing that vast pool of human knowledge and experience. Having evolved over centuries, they are irreplaceable, and their disappearance diminishes us all. An old pygmy once told Dr. Colin Turnbull, our life is good because the forest is good. It's everything we If something goes wrong, it must be because the forest is asleep and not watching over its children. We sing our songs because the forest will hear them and all will be well again. The pygmies, who refer to themselves as the children of the forest, have a saying, when the forest dies, its children die.